Let's bring in my panel, former Liberal MP Nicole Flint, proud South Australian farm girl, I might add, and Pauline Hanson's One Nation Chief of Staff and candidate too in the upcoming October state election, James Ashby. Well, welcome to you both. Um, James, I'm still scarred with some of the stuff that Labor does in the parliament historically, but you've been right to remind me they're back to all their old tricks. They're ramming stuff through. There's no proper debate on legislation. There's limited scrutiny. And Michaela Cash was making the point that this uh, likelihood now of small business owners being liable with prison sentences, Labor let this legislation, this, this amendment go through. They're trying to blame everyone else. Now they're trying to mop it up. But the numbers tell a very interesting story. Have a look at this. In the previous two parliaments, these are two coalition parliaments, there was a total of 26 bills rammed through using guillotines. Two bills in the 45th Parliament, 24 in the 46th. Now, compare that to the current Parliament. We're only halfway through the term. 39 bills already have been rammed through. So much for the PM being all about transparency in government, James. Why isn't the broader media covering yep. this? Well, it's a really good question. I'm glad you raised it, Peter, and uh, thanks for covering it because today made 40 guillotines uh, because, of course, with the uh, IR bills that they've just pushed through, again, with the help of crossbench like David Pocock, Jackie Lambie, and, of course, then you've got Lydia Thorpe down there in Victoria, where you are. Isn't she a great representative for you, Peter? Uh, these people are guillotining. So, in other words, just stopping, put a complete stop to the Senate being able to ask appropriate questions and flesh out legislation. This bill here, we know, is one of the most damaging bills. It's been amended significantly in the last 24 hours. It was about 8 o'clock last night that we started to get through the amendments that come through from Jackie Lambie and David Pocock that had been agreed to by the government. And the issue is, despite us having two really good lawyers in our offices, Malcolm Roberts has got a, a barrister, we've got a solicitor, they could not keep up with going through what these amendments were going to mean as they were voted on today. So there would have been a lot of very confused people, a lot of people scratching their head from the coalition also saying today, what the hell has happened to this bill? And, and what are the unintended consequences long term because of this guillotine where we are prevented from asking questions in the Senate? It is the House of Review, remember, and they've just shut it down. Yeah, it's a travesty. And of course, if the Liberal government does this, it's front page news with all the Fairfax papers and it's buried if Labor does it. Uh, the other thing that's buried too is, uh, is you know, modelling being released. It's all the transparency standards, yeah. Nicole, that the Prime Minister promised. This vehicle emissions modelling, he was supposed to put it out there. He hasn't. Industry's calling for it. We find out today that taxpayers have paid $750,000 for this modelling. Now, if we're paid for it, and it all relates to his claim that going electric is going to be cheaper for all of us. Put the, put the facts on the table. Why can't we see it? Precisely. Uh, taxpayers have paid for the modelling. They deserve to see what it has to say. But, Peter, this is just another example of where we cannot trust the Labor Party. The, the Prime Minister who said his word is his bond, you know, has, it didn't keep that bond when it came to tax cuts. And Labor has not kept their promise when it's come to cost of living. And this obsession that they have with electric vehicles is, can only lead to increased cost of living pressures on everyday, hard-working Australians. So... We know electric vehicles are, are more expensive and we need to see the modelling, which uh, you've got to assume if they're not releasing it may suggest that that is actually the case. Uh, people will have to use power to charge them. We've got record high power prices at the moment. If one of the batteries fails in your electric vehicle and it's out of warranty, then it's a cost between twelve dollars and $35,000 just to replace the battery, depending on the model. And that's before we even start to consider the huge cost to the Australian public of private and public charging infrastructure and having enough supply to even charge all of these cars if they're let into the country. And then, of course, you know, there's the, the very serious issue of what tradies, farmers, rural and regional residents, um, you know, grain nomads will do if there is no longer the supply of four-wheel drives that are powerful enough to do what they want to do in life, whether that's running a business or touring around the country. 
I'll get a comment from both of you on this. I'll start with you, James. This is the, the decision by the South Australian Premier to block Labor MPs from supporting the independence push in South Australia for a gender dysphoria inquiry. Now, this is the third attempt for an Australian inquiry. There's been plenty of them overseas. It's been stopped in Victoria, where Redeeming put it up. She was knocked back. Your boss, Pauline Hanson, put it up federally. She was knocked back. Uh, this, you know, if, if we're all so sure, the activists are so sure, that this is the right thing to do for young people, let's put the experts on the spot. Let's have an inquiry. What are they scared of? Well, this is a big problem. Sarah Game is our upper house uh, MLC there in uh, South Australia. Of course, she's going to have a lot to say about this. What is the problem with discussing this openly? I know in the federal sphere, we've sat down with parents whose children have transitioned and they are just so regretful they ever allowed their kids to go through with this problem. Now, the best people to speak about this is some of those kids that have been mutilated by doctors and physicians who gave the all clear for these kids to get the operation. Some of these kids will never, ever, ever return to normal functionality. Some of them, with their mental health these days, they, it, it never turned out the way they thought it would. They were sold a pup and, sadly, their parents went along with it instead of standing up for the rights of their kids and saying, listen, wait till you're over the age of 18 to make this proper decision for your own sake and for the rest of the family's sake too. We don't want to see you scarred for the rest of your life. This should have gone through. It would have been the first in the country. It's a shame it's been hit on the head. And Nicole, I made the point overseas, we've had these inquiries, it's, it's radically changed policies over there. We're doing policies in Australia that are 10 years old that have been abandoned by other countries. We learned today too, a father at Geelong Grammar has taken his daughter out of the school because she was set to share a dorm with a transitioning student, so a biological male. And the parents aren't even involved in some of these decisions, are they? No, that's, that's right, Peter, and hugely concerning for, for parents who take the big step to send their kids to boarding school for whatever reason. I went to boarding school, you know. Um, you, you want to know that your, your child is going to be safe and for most parents you make the decision that it is a single-sex environment because kids are not supervised uh, 24 hours a day, obviously. So uh, I can completely understand why this parent has done what they've done. But back to the South Australian Labor Party, what a pathetic display by Premier Peter Malinowskis this week to not stand up to his the left of his party, I assume, to allow Labor MPs, of which there are some very good social conservatives who share the rest of our concerns that... Are we putting vulnerable young kids at risk, children who cannot make an informed decision as an adult, about treatment that may have life-changing ramifications? All the inquiry wanted to do was explore precisely what the treatment procedures are, what the support is in place for kids, and are we doing the right thing? Are we, uh, are we undertaking our duty of care properly to children who most need our protection because we do not want children in two, five, ten years' time coming back and saying, this was negligent, yep. I yep. should never yep. have had this yep. treatment, my life has been ruined. I've got to leave it there. I'm out of time, but I couldn't agree more. Thank you both for being with me on Thursday.